Welcome back. Perhaps we should be taking a cue on saving money from the British. This week, the UK government announced it is looking to privatize its majority stake in its postal service. And with our own postal service here in the United States bleeding $25 million a day, Mike, you say we should privatize too. Explain. Absolutely, Elizabeth. Privatizing the Postal Service would give it much needed flexibility when it comes to delivery, pricing, scheduling, all of those things. The Postal Service is losing $20 million a day. It needs to be privatized. What do you think, Rick Unger? Now, unfortunately, you got to remember the United States is not England. England is a much smaller country. If we were to privatize it, you would have a lot of rural areas in this country where it would become way too expensive because the post office wouldn't want to go there, and you cannot cut these people off from mail service. Big cities, easy, no problem. Get rid of Saturdays, I'm good with that. Completely privatized, it'll never work. Dan Mitchell, I mean, the UK is the size of Louisiana, and I think that the United States Postal Service delivers half a billion packages and letters a day versus like 50 million for the UK. But the thing is, when you look at what FedEx is doing, FedEx has a third of its uh, costs going to labor, right? With the US Postal Service, 80% of, of its costs go to labor. Go ahead. Government is just inherently inefficient. Now, the U.S. Constitution actually does give the federal government the authority to run a postal service, unlike a Department of Housing and Urban Development or a Department of Agriculture, but that doesn't mean it has to. And when you look at countries like Germany that already have privatized their postal systems, heck, you know, Canada privatized their air traffic control system, Sweden has school choice, so private schools are taking over there, Australia privatized their social security system. This is the wave of the future if we want intelligent, low-cost government with better services for people. Of course, this should be in the private sector. But if someone's living in a rural area, they should pay a little bit more. Just like if you live in a city, you might have to pay for mass transit. So Get that's rid of the all point. these cross subsidies. And by the way, 90% of the mail out there, I think, is business junk mail. Um, Sabrina, <laughs> what do you make of Dan Mitchell's point? Uh, would the local rural individual out there uh, have to pay more if you privatize? Yeah, look, we don't set policies based on the outliers, and that's what we're talking about here. The fact is that in the marketplace, businesses that don't adapt fail all the time. I like to look at Blockbuster. It was a, it was a bad business model. It failed to modernize, and then you know, online video rentals like Netflix came in and replaced them. The problem is the U.S. Postal Service, if it wants to modernize, it has to beg and barter with Congress. It is an inefficient system. It should be privatized. That's the only way to save tax dollars more money and to make it more efficient overall. Yeah, Rich Carlgaard, to Sabrina's point, the U.S. Postal Service is living on loans off the Treasury, right? And so the thing is, We've all talked about how government can work better as a business. Make, make the Postal Service act like a business. I always wonder why the Postal Service is not in shopping malls, it's not in drug stores, it's not in grocery stores. I mean, maybe that's an idea to consider, too. Go ahead, Rich. Well, I just don't think they're capable of it. Look, I'm a big fan of UPS and I'm a big fan of FedEx. These are two tremendously run companies. But there is a point, and I do agree, oddly enough, uh, with Rick Unger on the point about <laughs> rural two. service. We do have to figure it out. And to the point that they should pay more, you know, uh, that, that, that there's a lot of poverty in these rural areas. I don't know that the people are capable of paying more. Yeah, to uh, John Tamney, what do you make of that Rich Carlgaard's point that if you privatize, it's going to basically drive people's costs up for the U.S. Postal service. Well, I think Rick and Rich make the good argument for privatization. What is capitalism? What are markets are about? They are about solving problems. They are about room, removing unease from our lives. The Postal Service does it in a very expense, expensive way, and it's a very unserviceable way. No one likes going to the post office. If you privatize it, I think you'll very quickly see that markets and capitalism will solve the rural problem in a way that rural people will like. Rick Unger, what do you think? They well, have it for bandwidth. I, I, I don't they agree with that. They'll just, bandwidth. They'll, they'll just Wow. They'll just ignore them. But I do have to point out, I really enjoyed Dan <laughs> from the Cato Institute, a good, solid libertarian, talking up all of those European governments, telling us how good they are. That doesn't happen very often. I enjoyed that. Dan, what do you think? I, I, I'm perfectly willing to give credit where credit is due. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to be in some of these countries An because honest of their man. taxes and spending, but they're making some good decisions on how to deliver services at lower cost with the private sector. An That's honest man. Carl Gard, you, you wanted to jump in. Rich Carl Gard. Uh, well, look, uh, you know, I'm not sure, to John Tamney's point, that the market can solve these sparsely populated uh, market problems. I mean, it simply hasn't. The rural parts of the United States are still lacking in broadband communications. So, 
you know, this is a real problem. I'm for, you know, 90% privatization. I just think you have to keep these smaller communities in mind in some way. Yeah, it's a real tough call. Gang, you were terrific there. Next up, Hannity on the insanity as the battle over immigration reform heats up in Washington, D.C. Now, what is Sean's solution? He's telling Eric Bowling on cashing in at the bottom of the hour. But up next here, kids no longer making the cut. Young adults are putting off parenthood. Now, is that good or bad news for the U.S. economy? No kidding around with this debate. That's next. Don't go away. I have a young daughter, but both me and my husband work full time. And I don't think we'd be able to afford the, the family, a large family, like generations before us. As the economy remains shaky. Now, is that bad news for the economy going forward? Sabrina. I think it is bad news, and I'm not just saying that because my three little ones might be watching the show today. I think too often we're talking about marriage and starting a family as if it's all costs, and we ignore the benefits of these institutions. The reality is when you have a family, these are vital stabilizing forces that an economy really benefits from. Rick Unger, what do you think? You know, I think in the main it's neutral. I'm not sure it has that big of, of an effect on the economy. But if I'm going to pick one, I'm going to say it's good. And the reason I'm going to say that is it shows that this younger generation are using their heads, not just their hearts. They're making decisions based on what's sensible. And that has to be a good omen for the future of, of the economy. Now, Rich Carlgar, you're a student of the economy. Um, you know, after the Great Depression, yeah, we we saw the birth rate drop, but then there was, you know, the baby boom. Then there was an econo economic growth. We're not really seeing that now. So what does this mean for this trend here? I think it's a bad development. It means that the U.S. is following Europe and Japan to a very bad place. I'm completely with Sabrina on the, on the fact that, uh, fa you know, when you're a, particularly if you're uh, a man, and I think for women also, this just disciplines you. You have to focus on the future when suddenly you're responsible for a family. So it's a good thing overall. Moreover, we also have an entitlement bomb problem. We've got to affix entitlement payments. But just remember, it's young people who are supporting the retired. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, Dan, you know, President Clinton has said the baby boom is turning into a senior boom. What does this trend in record low birth rates uh, mean for the U.S. economy and the U.S. government going forward? In the long run, if we follow Japan and Europe to demographic suicide, because that's what's happening, they're going from having these population pyramids to having population cylinders, and even a small welfare state is just unaffordable with that kind of demographic profile. But the key thing to understand is causality. It's not, uh, you, you want to have the cart and the horse in the right order. A bad government policy with a big welfare state is going to drive down birth rates. Uh, and that's what's happening in Europe. And I think it's beginning to happen in the U.S. So that's going to then feed back into the welfare states becoming unaffordable. So but the answer is you can't just tell people have more kids. You have to begin to pare back government and give people more freedom. Then I think you'll get more household formation and more kids. Wow. So John, tell me what Dan is saying is essentially big government is wrecking it for young adults who want to have kids because it's too expensive. Go ahead. He may well be right, but I just don't find compelling this death of birth argument causing economic suicide around the world. The reality is that we live in not in country economies, but in interconnected global economy. The idea that one country's birth rates is going to harm it when they're trading with the rest of the world just isn't compelling. I would say a lack of economic freedom is far more economically corrosive than low birth rates, which are really an effect of low growth. Sabrina, what do you think? Well, actually, I was thinking that what Dan was saying is, is right on, that ultimately, look at our tax system, for instance. It incentivizes people to behave in certain ways. So do they put off or do they get married because of the tax system or put off marriage because of the tax system? And similarly, when they decide to start a family, we want to get government out of the way so that people make decisions that are best for them and their families. Um, and certainly things that are as personal as marriage and family um, should, should not be you know, dictated by our, our government. All right, we've got to leave it there. Coming up, 